to cast spay rods effectively, whether they're a little tiny one or two weight trout spay, or a big rod like a nine or a 10 weight that you might use for king salmon or in, in Europe for Atlantic salmon, is to get your grip spread apart in such a way that you in effect create what's called a fulcrum. A good grip is at the upper hand, regardless of whether it's your right or left, is up high and that your lower hand is low. Basically stretched. Why? I'm creating a fulcrum here. And that fulcrum will be a leading, leading component of a good cast. If I slip down and I edge up, I lose that fulcrum. It doesn't mean you wouldn't cast, it wouldn't go out there, but it's never gonna get on the, the plane of greatness. So try to stretch your hands, create that fulcrum right out of the gate as a caster, okay? Your stance. I'm a big proponent that whatever shoulder you're casting off is that the foot of that shoulder is slightly forward. So in the case of me casting off this right shoulder, I'm gonna have my right foot just ever so slowly or slightly in front of me. And that way, when I actually go to make this cast, as my body has some sort of movement and twist, almost like a golf swing, I can plant off that forward facing leg, off that shoulder. So there's an alignment factor coming from here to there. And if I've got a lot of little body movement in it, it kind of sinks in and sinks out, okay? All right, so every spay cast you ever make will have three strokes to it. An anchor stroke, a D-loop stroke, a forward stroke. When problems occur, it's gonna revert back to one of those three. Again, anchor stroke, D-loop stroke, forward stroke. And while I have spent the last 20 years trying to develop a spay parrot, who I could sell in bulk to sit on your shoulder and to tell you what you did wrong, back, more bottom hand. I've not developed my spay parrot. So you have got to self-diagnose problems. Once you leave this beach in the sanctity of this event and you get away from Fred or Calvin or me or Kurt or Eric and some of the other lads, you got to self-diagnose. You got to do it. So remember within those three strokes, any given thing that goes wrong is gonna diagnose back into those three buckets, okay? Let's start with the anchor stroke. The anchor stroke is simply the, the placement of the fly into a position that starts out our cast and is move number one on our way to move number two. Anchor stroke leads to D-loop stroke. Where people get in trouble with an anchor stroke is they tend to overpower it. That would be sufficiently overpowered and I could make that little move to save myself because it's only a mistake if you make it twice, okay? So, but somebody up on the road watching me would go, well, that guy kind of threw a funky cat can of cast off his, off his uh, upstream shoulder down there. He would have no idea I screwed up the cast because I recovered it. Again, it's only a mistake if you make it twice. So the key to a really good anchor is to simply just make a drawbridge out of, out of the movement. Watch this. Simply drawbridge upstream. And when you do that, your arms will look just like this. They're inverted. That's all I did. I didn't throw it. I didn't crank it up there. I just inverted my arms. And once I do that, and that rod is literally pointed upstream, 
you know, just take it as I'm turned around, that anchor will occur organically right off that move. And it didn't require any heavy lifting. All it required was what I call London Bridge went over. That sets you up to come around and to establish a D-loop. So make your anchor easy. Don't make your anchor this big, heavy lifting proposition. Just invert your arms and take the rod all the way down. You'll notice when I do that, I literally come all the way horizontal, pointed up stream. That's my anchor. So that will always result in a good D-loop. If you jack it and that fly represented by that yarn goes above you in the formation of that anchor, you have gone too far. So if that happens and you go a little too far, you can wait it out. I can wait that thing out to come below me and then make the cast. It won't be a great cast, but it's not a cast that, you know, completely shit the bed and was done, okay? So, D-loop. D-loop has two components. Come around, come up. Come around, come up. Both of those matter. Around is what gathers and creates the proximity within the D-loop. Up sets the stage for a perpendicular D-loop that will travel far and fast. And that's what we want, far and fast, okay? And once I come around and up all the way to me, I've arrived at what is called the upright, or since the king gets coronated today, the British call the key position. The key position is the upright position. How many of you, which I'm guessing is 100%, have been fly fishing with a single-handed rod? Everybody? We bat in a thousand, okay? So when you go to make a simple roll cast, that roll cast is the, the building block of the D-loop within the spay cast. It's the same animal with a different tool. And so when you come into that key position with this spay rod, the principles that are found in that roll cast now match up. In other words, you're going to come around and you're going to stop somewhere between 1 and 2 o'clock. So if straight above you is noon, one, two. You're gonna come around and your D-loop at the key position will be somewhere right there. The two spots where people get into trouble is they either tilt back too much or they're too, believe it or not, too vertical. Both of those are problematic. Tilt back is problematic because if you end up here in your D-loop, you are essentially setting yourself up to cast that way, which is probably not what our target was. If you come around and you are too vertical, basically at 1215, even 1230, you're actually too vertical to form any sort of real D-loop and that's gonna be an equal problem. So as you swing around in that D-loop development and you come around and stop, you should be around one to two o'clock. One to two o'clock. That will establish a D-loop that is of a nice belly formation that's ready to go. So you don't want to be too far back and you certainly don't want to be too vertical. All right. Anchor, D-loop, forward stroke. 
So in the forward stroke is where the magic happens or where the disaster unfolds, right? Okay. And where you're going to get huge strides in your spay cast is going to be your mental development of getting mine to teach bottom hand to pull. Bottom hand cures all ills with these things. So if you've been fishing with a single-handed rod, you've been fishing with a spinning rod, you are used to one hand, one arm, having all this primary power and purpose, right? That's out the window with this thing. It's out the window. Oftentimes in classes, some of our easiest to teach students have never fly fished. In some cases, have never had a fishing rod in their hand because we don't have to break them of previous learned traits and habits, okay? And this is where the spay rod differs from all other fishing tools in that your bottom hand, which seems like in a really obvious place to not really do anything, turns out does everything, everything. So as you come successfully off that anchor, into that D loop, you want your hands in this position right here. Notice that that reel is out in front of me and it is fundamentally just below my chin. The two places you don't want it, you don't want to be up here, this isn't gonna go well, and you don't want to be too low. You don't want to be belly button with reel. Everybody see that? Because if you're low, all you're gonna do is push. If you're high, all you're gonna do is hope. You're, gonna, you're also gonna push. So when you come around into that key position, that upright or key position, again, the British call it the key position, that reel should be under your chin and out in front of you because that will set the stage to pull the lever. Pull the lever. So let me stand here so you guys can watch this occur. Watch my left hand. All of that speed, all of that carry, that whole prognosis is built off my ability, my willingness to pull that bottom hand, to pull. I can tell you guys that in all the world of athletics and sport, there is only one thing that mimics this move. Anybody here can, can tell me what that is? Nope. Who said it? Lacrosse. Lacrosse, the only thing like it. You watch those lacrosse players with those rackets, particularly those girls that are going crazy out there and really get into it. You will watch them. They pull that racket. They don't shove it. They go like that. It's the only thing like this in sport is a lacrosse pull. Only thing out there. The average person. What is the average person? Exactly 98 out of 100 will take 22 to 30 hours to get the bottom hand to cue in. I've seen exactly two students in 33 years. Two who could have taught the class in two hours. Two. And I had them both in the same class. One of them was obviously going to be the guy to do it because of his name. His name was Jack Fly. <laughs> and the other guy was a tremendous, tremendous single-handed caster who had guided in Alaska and in Russia. And he, he just seemed destined to do it. I had them both the same class. 
Two hours in, they could have been teaching it. They were that good. But that's a rare bird, really rare. So we put it all together. And that bottom hand is going to be the key to the party. Pull the lever. You pull the lever, it goes. You don't pull it, it doesn't go. Okay? Now, I had a gentleman about 20 minutes ago ask me about the whole bottom hand thing in terms of how can I get better at pulling? How can I be more consistent? There's three things that'll lead to that. One is time. Again, 22 to 30 hours for 98% of people before the aha moment. The second thing is to go verbal on the subject, meaning that when you go to cast, you actually say to yourself, as you come into this set, you go, I got to pull the lever. And you say that to yourself. That's your second mode of attack. The third one, which is truly spay CPR. Thanks for that one, Kurt. I'm going to get a lot of mileage out of that one now. Spay CPR for your bottom hand is something I learned from a guy named Joran Anderson, who's from Sweden, and he's really the Michael Jordan of Sweden when it comes to spay casting. And Joran showed me this in 1991. And he, he said, George, if you have somebody who just can't not push the upper hand, just, just can't get away from shoving it, he said, there is something you can do. And he showed me what it was. And all you allow the caster to do is to touch his fingers. You guys see that? That's all you let them do. So when you take that versus your grip or any sort of grip, and it's now a finger touch, you will organically force the motion. So if I simply, that's all I get, I have to pull because I got nothing else to go with. Finger touch, point, D-loop, pull. That's 100% off the bottom hand because there's no contact point with the upper hand. So there's time, there's conversation between mind and muscle, and then there's the Swedish approach, which will cure you. Trust me, it will do it, okay? In order to have a great, consistent cast, the bottom hand has to become the power broker. As rods get bigger, the upper hand will have a little more play, say a 14 foot nine weight, a 15 foot 10 weight, which there might be one of these around. If, if Calvin wants to cast one, you can watch him throw halfway across, but also bring him a bottle of Advil because he'll need some with that rod. Okay, some other things to keep in mind with these is you have all these spay rods are rigged up with some form of head. It could be a skagit based head, which is really good for throwing big sink tips with larger flies. Big sink tips, larger flies, skagit line is kind of the line of choice. A lot of these rods have a Scandi style line on it. And when you think about living in Spokane, Coeur d'Alene, the Inland Empire, your Clearwater River to the south, your Grand Ronde, and even the main stem snake on both the Idaho and the Washington side, those are all fall, summer, fall, winter targets. And those rivers all lend themselves to a Scandi style line. Regardless of whether you're playing with a Skagit head or a Scandi head or some other form of spay head, the one common denominator with all of those to get your head around is this phenomena of overhang. What is overhang? Overhang is that line that lies between the tip of that rod and the back of that head. That is referred to as overhang. 
on any given setup, on any given rod, there will be a sweet spot within the specter of that overhang. It could be six inches. It could be 36 inches. Odds are it's between 18 and 30 inches. Odds are 18, 30. That's generally it. Sometimes it's shorter, sometimes it's longer. Again, until the spay parrot flies over and lands on your shoulder, you're gonna have to diagnose that with your setup. Which is to say, play with it. That's a real short overhang. That is a pretty long one. Somewhere between that four and a half feet and that six inches is the sweet spot within the specter of that overhang. That is something to get your head around and play with to find a sweet spot. That sweet spot will vary based on length of rod, length of tip, all sorts of things, okay? So for instance, this is a 13 and a half foot seven weight Sage Sonic. This is, this is my favorite rod on the clear water. I, I will live and die off this type of rod down there. I'll go smaller on the Grand Ron, but on the clear water, this is the starter. Based on the head length on this gadget with the sink tip that's on here, this particular setup lends itself to a longer than average overhang on this particular setup. Okay. Did you guys happen to hear that noise? What did that noise represent? I'm gonna turn my mistake into your lesson. What did it represent? It represents the sounds of spay. The sounds of spay. What does that do? The sounds of spay will actually be one of your best teachers. If you hear noise behind you, the odds are you hit it too fast. The odds are noise behind you, you hit it too fast. If you hear the French slurping soup in front of you, too slow. Noise in front in water, too slow. Noise in air behind you, too fast. Yes, the spay parrot would tell you that, but again, he's not here. Okay? So, finding that overhang that also coincides, I might add, with how deep you're wading. Okay, ideal wading length with one of these is above the ankle to above the knee. You don't buy one of these things to charge out there to your belly button. Although I've got a guy I fished with over the years, Tom Wall, sports med dog from, doc from Phoenix, who was a walk-on fullback at, for Joe Paterno at Penn State. He charges out right to here, right to the warning track every day, first thing. I go, Tom, the reason why we can, nope, he's out there. I don't know, just, he's got sturdy legs. So ideally, I don't wanna wade deep with these, but depending on how I choose to wade will depend on, it. that will go into that overhang. There'll be less overhang the deeper I'm wading. I can promise you that part, okay? So the sounds of spay, remember that. Noise in the air behind you, you hit the cast too fast. Slurp, you waited too long. Waited too long, okay? All right? Questions? Too fast in relation to I'll show you. You're coming forward. So 
Here's an example of absolutely too fast. So I came up and I just rapidly shot out of it. It was too fast. You might hear a snap. In fact, I heard some earlier today. And fortunately, the, guy, the gentleman didn't do it more than once, so I didn't have to tell him to take his lion back to the circus. Because we don't want any lion taming going on out here. Okay? But if you hear that noise behind you and up, odds are you went too fast. By contrast, too slow would sound like this. And I actually got away with it because I'm so far above the water. So if I go out here, and this is about as deep as I want to wade with a spay rod. Now put your ears on for this one. You could hear a bunch of noise right there. That's fundamentally too slow. And you might pull it off and blow one like that where you were too slow, but you managed to get it to go because once again, the bottom hand cures all ills. I pulled enough on that to get it to go. Had I not had that octane in that bottom hand, it, believe me, it ain't going. Okay. Questions? It's a guidance system. It's a guidance system. It, it certainly is going forward. It's not going forward with any appreciable force. Having said that, somebody with a 14 foot nine weight or a 15 foot 10 weight, the bigger spay rods, that upper hand can come into that modem with more push and it not create any ill effect. But as the rods are more average, and what's average? Average, folks, is basically 12 foot six to 13 foot six. Those are the average spay rods in each and every one of these booths. The trout spay rods, the little guys, 10 foot nine to 11 foot nine, those guys are far more sensitive to cast because they're smaller. And because they're smaller, you as a caster have to become smaller. We frequently tell people with, with the trout space to visualize their whole movement and their whole operandi to be that of casting out of a phone booth, a good old phone booth. Tight, concise, no big moves, no big octane, yada, yada, yada. Questions? Well, the 15 foot for a 10, 15 foot for a 9, 14 foot for a 9, even a 14 foot for an 8, just the mere size of that tool, that rod is gonna lend itself to allowing that upper hand a little more leeway with push. Is there any other adjustment on the upper hand that? Bring some Advil for the end of your day. Yeah. Hey George, can you go over the mechanics one more time with the uh, London Bridge and then the D-loop? Sure. Just one more time. So again, every spay cast you ever make has three components, three parts. D-loop, no, pardon me, anchor, D-loop, forward stroke. Virtually 100% of any maladies, any problems, will diagnose back into one of those silos. Back into one of those three silos. A really good D-loop will be done with relative ease no real energy exertion. In the case of this cast, the double spay, 
which for a right-handed angler, river right, no wind or downstream wind, which we got a very moderate, very light downstream wind, this is a killer cast. London Bridge. Rod is pointed upstream. Rod has gone fully over. The bridge has come over and it's gone completely horizontal, pointed upstream. Your arm should look just like that. Anchor. The purpose of that anchor represented by that yarn hereby being your fly, is to pull that thing within a proximity, in the case of the double spay, on your downstream side. What is the proximity that you seek? You seek within the length of your rod. So if this is a 13 and a half footer, then my window with that anchor is to get it within the length of this rod. Ideally, I want it three inches off my hip. I want it as close to this hip as I can get her. But as long as I'm within the specter of the length of my rod, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in the game. Why would I want to pull it closer? It's a proximity issue. The closer I can get it, the more concise my D-loop can set up as a perpendicular mechanism to go straight and far. Straight and far. So, anchor. The D-loop is a movement that comes around and also comes up. It comes around and comes up. And what that movement really looks like is you're creating, you're, you're rotating around and coming up. Your hands actually look like that. They come around, they go up, around and up. You can sit on your couch and in between commercials, you can go around and up Pull the bottom hand. You could actually say to yourself, swivel to key, bottom hand pull. Is there like a plane? The plane is more upward than it is level. The problem with level, it leaves line on the water, which creates stick, which creates a fight forthcoming. Well, you can have it ripping. But you're going to want to be more in the tilt than in the level. Because once you stick that line up on the water, you then have to fight to get that line off that water, around, up, into a D-loop. So we've got anchor, D-loop, around and up, creating the key position, as the English will call it. Bottom hand, pull. Listen to that. Brian Sylvie, who is here, famously said upwards of 20 years ago, if I don't hear Gore-Tex slap, I don't even need to watch you. If I don't hear that, I already know you didn't pull. See the velocity of that bottom hand moves? That's what this looks like. And yes, I can punch myself out. Okay? Questions? You're welcome. Well, the spade gremlins are little guys. 
and sometimes they jump out of the water and sometimes they come out of your reel and they jump up and they they do things that's a very frequent problem and what that is it's usually a d loop directional malady okay so his question was he's made all the moves he's come around he's hit it and it's kind of going out there like my a, a good d loop would look like this perpendicular lineal the one he's describing goes out like this watch my arm because I've been doing this so long I actually can't duplicate that sorry <laughs> but I can duplicate it with my arm it comes out but it comes out like this it kind of it, it goes to Smith's over to Johnson's and finally lands at Landers. It just kind of goes <coughs> versus. What's happened there is the D loop alignment was not linear. In other words, your D loop, a really good example of that, we'll see if I can duplicate it, is if my anchor is left way short. Notice how far that, that yarn, I don't know if you guys see that, but just for reference, that yarn was 10 or 12 feet past my 13 foot rod. If I leave it that short, so in other words, I'm way short. When I go into that D loop, you can see there's X amount of line here and there's X amount there. It is preset to come whirlwind and out. So the keer is, D is anchor proximity to create that linear D loop. That's the answer. So keep an eye on that anchor placement and work to get it closer to you like that, which will result in a longer, straighter cast. Make sense? Okay, any other questions? Any other answers? Thanks so much.